Okay, before we change the tape, we were on number nine, um, pointing out that the expression, the end, is equivocated upon, two different senses are given to it. The end of a thing is its perfection, means the purpose of a thing is what makes it perfect. Death is the end of life, means not the purpose, but rather the terminal point, the end point. And um, so to say that death is the perfection of life is um, a cute conclusion but drawn from um, an equivocation on the term. Okay, let's look at number 13. If you can tie a knot, you can make a beautiful deep pile rug. Hmm. I said this one was about this composition because just because you can do one part of the rug doesn't mean you can make the whole thing. I agree. It's, it's taken something that's true of a part must be true of the whole. Good. Number 15. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Okay, what fallacy could arise from this? That could definitely be a uh, case of accident. Yes. In fact, I, you've probably heard people do that. The Bible says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. But you can go ahead and bear false witness against people that live across town or <laughs> in another state or something, right? <laughs> so. That, this is not a fallacy in itself. It could lead to a fallacy depending on how you accent it, so you miss the point. Okay, uh, let's take one more of these. Number 19. <clears throat> you have believed the lie that you cannot get well. The truth will make you free. Love nature. She is gentle and holy. To obey her is to live. Uh, Hypothetization. Hypostatization. Hypost I'll get that right, yeah. Hypost <laughs> okay, what, what term is hypostatized? <laughs> nature? <laughs> nature, that's right. It's treating a series of events as though it were a concrete entity. All right, that's enough on um, the fallacies of ambiguity. Let's look at how Engel summarizes the fallacies of presumption. And you will find the summary on pages uh, 120 to 122, where there's a similar chart that lays it out very nicely for us. Here he gives uh, just the individual fallacies, which I want to look at, and then I want to look at the way he breaks them into um, different categories. First of all, the fallacy of sweeping generalization. Applying a fair generalization, one that is usually true, to an exceptional case by ignoring the peculiarities of the case. It is treating a generalization like it was universally true rather than just generally true. Here's the example. Since horseback riding is helpful exercise, Harry Brown ought to do more of it because it will be good for his heart condition. Well, to say that in general horseback riding is a healthy exercise doesn't mean that it's universally true. It just means it's generally true. So when you say that a person with heart condition should do it, that doesn't necessarily follow. Everyone understand the sweeping generalization? It treats the generalization as though it were a universal truth instead of a general truth. There are exceptions to generalizations. Now, hasty generalization is the opposite. Instead of moving from a generalization to a particular, this moves from a particular to a generalization. Using insufficient evidence or an isolated example as the basis for a widely general conclusion. And so here's the example. I had a bad time with my former husband. From that, I've learned that all men are no good. Okay, that's a hasty general. That's too quick to generalize because you haven't got enough evidence here or you may have evidence of unique cases. You can't tell, um, so you shouldn't have generalized. Everyone understands sweeping and hasty generalization in the different direction they move? Hasty means taking a few examples that may be unique and treating them as though they're the general rule. A sweeping generalization is treating the generalization as something more than a general truth, but as a sweeping or universal truth. The next uh, fallacy of presumption is bifurcation. In other words, um, I've always called this false antithesis, by the way. I don't know if that helps you at all, but it's laying out this or that as though those were the only options. 
he calls it bifurcation, considering a distinction or classification exclusive and exhaustive when other alternatives exist. Notice he says other names for it, and, um, either or fallacy, black and white fallacy, false dilemma. No, know why didn't put down false antithesis. That's the way I like to call it. Anyway, here's an example. You're either for me or against me. Isn't that true? Let's forget Jesus for a minute right now. Is that true? No, I, I might... I, I'm asking you to support my candidacy for student body president, either for me or against me. Well, no, as a matter of fact, I might be against your candidacy, but very much in favor of you. I mean, I like you as a fan, but I just don't think you'll be a good president. Okay, people get their feelings hurt because they have this either or false antithesis sort of thing. Now, when Jesus said this, he was not for me, is against me. Of course, that is true in terms of your ultimate commitment in life. You're either going to be following Jesus or you're not following because he doesn't take anything less than wholehearted, single-minded devotion. In that case, it's not a false antithesis. Do we see here again how fallacies are affected by one's worldview and presupposition? Begging the question in three forms. First of all, one can offer as a premise a simple restatement of the desired conclusion, A because of B, where B is the same as A. Um, that circular reasoning on your outline, I think, is what I put it to help distinguish it. Miracles are impossible because they cannot happen. Well, impossible and cannot happen mean the same thing, so that's not much of an argument. Here's another form of begging the question. A circular argument, more complex than one, but eventually justifying the conclusion with itself. A because of B, where B is dependent on A. And here he gives us an example. God exists. How do you know? The Bible says so. How do you know what the Bible says? It's the Word of God. Okay? That is a form of circular reasoning as well, where it's not based on the terms mean the same thing, but what you're appealing to depends on your conclusion being true. And a third form, subsuming a suspect particular under a generalization that is even more problematic, A because of B, where B is even more suspect than A. The evidence you cite to prove a conclusion should be more certain than the conclusion itself. Clearly, he's an atheist. He's a philosopher, isn't he? which depends on what? The wider generalization that all philosophers are atheists. Okay, another fallacy of presumption is the question-begging epithet. This is not treated separately by Kofi. Using strongly emotional language to force home an otherwise unsupported conclusion. That is, you build into the way you describe the situation of the person the very thing you're supposed to be proving. So it's question-begging by the way you emotionally um, Lance, your description, the scheming, bigoted efforts of the Board of Education have finally come to fruition. Well, that's also called mudslinging, name-calling, using slanted jargon, whatever. Um, notice that the question-begging epithet doesn't have to be negative. It can also be positive, the eulogistic epithet. Surely there can be no question, Ed's our man. He's just a great guy. Okay, so you don't prove the point here. You just re-describe Ed with uh, that slanted language. Okay, now the complex question, which we studied before, the interrogative form of begging the question. That is, you, you, you ask the question in such a way that you're assuming something one way or the other without having to support it. The purported question bringing an assumption with it that needs to be questioned. Notice he puts here, do not call an example a complex question unless it has a question mark in it. Complex question only appears in the form of a question is what he's saying. Well, some people get mixed up. You, know? <laughs> I don't know. you have to remember, we've already been taught that grammatical form is not the same as function, but here it is specifically a question that, that veils the begging of the issue. Why is it that women are more interested in religion than men? 
Well, I mean, first of all, is that true? And then what's the answer to the, I mean, how do you explain it if it is? Shouldn't be taken for granted. Special pleading, I love this one. Applying a double standard that is exemplified in the choice of words. Um, horses sweat, men perspire, women glow. <laughs> like conjugating an irregular verb, right? I am firm, you are, what is it? No, no, you are stubborn, he is pig-headed, something like that. That's special pleading, uh, not looking at it in the same way, in an impar uh, looking at things impartially, but applying a different standard to yourself. I, it might be helpful for me to point out, my work in evangelical theology, apologetics, and ethics would lead me to say, as a generalization, yeah, and I don't think a hasty one, that probably this is the most common fallacy committed by um, theologians and amateur theologians and wannabe theologians who think they can you know, criticize something. And you come back and say, well, now, did you apply that standard to your own school of thought or to yourself? I mean, let me ask you a few questions. You may find out that it's a pure case of special pleading. Um, well, I'll get off this subject by giving examples. Just, I want to warn you that Christians are real prone to double standards. What, what, what is the uh, difference between part, uh, begging the question number three, and the uh, ad hominem uh, origin or circumstance? Is it in the way it's presented? Begging the question number three says you subsume a suspect particular under a generalization that is even more problematic. You can't prove a point by arguing from the obscure to the more obscure. That's, that's not the same as looking at the circumstances. Okay, because... Okay. We turn the page, we have another fallacy of presumption in false analogy. Reaching a conclusion by likening or comparing two significantly incomparable cases. And you take some slight comparison and make that the basis for an argument, but it doesn't, it's not really significant, or it doesn't prove similarity in the relevant way in which the argument would require. Typically, the two cases used will be similar, but not in the respect that would warrant the conclusion in question. And it gives uh, an example. How can you tell your children not to take money from others when the government they live under does it all the time? Assuming what? That um, uh, there's an analogy between what? Uh, between children taking money from others, stealing, and what the government does through legitimate taxation. Okay. There is a trifling comparison. Money is exchanging hands, <laughs> but not, not in the relevant uh, respect. And that's kind of like saying um, that in the Old Testament, uh, a bride price was paid, a dowry was paid you know, for a bride, and in the civil government, fines were assessed, or restitution had to be made. Therefore, you draw the conclusion that marriage was seen as a form of uh, criminal penalty. You know, there's an analogy, but not in the relevant respect. Okay, false cause is the fallacy of presumption. Inferring a causal link between two events when no such causal connection has been established. Um, and he uses this as his key example. Sequence alone is no proof of consequence, which is the one that we're familiar with. Post hoc, ergo propter hoc, or whatever the Latin is after this, therefore because of this. His example, have you noticed how the sales went up after we instituted our new advertising campaign? Our success is obvious. Well, there may be a causation here, but it's not going to be proven just by the sequence, the temporal sequence. Now, on the outline that I gave you, you will notice I gave three forms of false cause. Uh, there at the bottom. Uh, coincidence, succession, and common cause. You have false cause in the form of coincidence where it's just a, uh, 
it just so happens that two things are happening at the same time, that doesn't mean that they were affecting each other. Succession is the one that we've been talking about usually, that it happened after this and therefore that caused it. Then common cause is another form of false cause, where what you have is one thing causing two things to happen. Let's say that A causes B and C. Since B and C are always found together, we assume, well, then B must have caused C, when in fact B and C were separately caused by A. So that's what I meant by those three different versions of false cause. Um, Kofi and Engel only give you one of those, the sequence version or succession version of it. I think Engel does discuss this. Oh, does he? I'm pretty sure he does. Oh, okay. Well, good. If, if I've forgotten that, then look at the section on um, false cause and see if he gives you all the versions. In the summary, I notice he only gives you the sequence one. But let's move ahead. Slippery slope. The slippery slope is assuming unjustifiably that a proposed step will set off an undesirable and uncontrollable chain of events without justification, assuming that the taking one step means you're going to have to take all sorts of steps. You'd like saying, boy, you'd better not eat one burrito at Taco Bell, Dr. Bonson, because if you do, then you'll eat everything that they have there and you'll blow up. And no one would take that seriously, but that is a version of slippery slope. You know, you take one step, who knows, you might be able to stop. Let's look at his example and see if you have any questions. His example of slippery slope is today it's abortion, tomorrow it will be the mentally ill, and then the infirm and the aged, or anyone else considered undesirable. That's slippery slope because it takes for granted that um, abortion is not something that is done in itself, but is done only as the first step in a sequence. And therefore, to take the first step means you're going to have to take all the other steps, you'll end up killing anybody that's undesirable. Now, is slippery slope a fallacious argument? What's it going to depend on? Well, in some cases, it's going to depend upon your presuppositions about man, morality, about the nature of the world, and things like that. Many slippery slope arguments are um, fallacious. I would even say this one about abortion, if, it, if you don't supply some other premises, is fallacious. The fact that a person believes in abortion does not mean that they are committed to uh, wiping out anybody undesirable. But what we would argue, we could add some stuff to it to make that a good argument, and I think it is a good argument when you say, if the principle that is taken away when you allow abortion is the respect for human life, once you, res once you remove that principle, you may not be willing to go all the way, but logically you have no reason to stop because you have just eliminated the reason why we don't kill anybody undesirable. Now do you see how it becomes a, a, not a fallacious, but a, a legitimate and I think a cogent argument? What we want to say is, this must eventuate in that? No, what we want to say is, logically there's no reason to keep from going that way. Now whether society moves that way or not would be another matter. And then finally, we have the irrelevant thesis again, and I think we've had a little bit of confusion on that, so let's make sure we, we get it. Um, irrelevant thesis, seeking, perhaps succeeding, to prove a conclusion that's not at issue. And he says it can take the form of either attacking someone else's claim irrelevantly, like instead of proving your position, what you do is you show that someone else's position is bad. If a political candidate says, my opponent's program for helping the poor is full of holes when what he was supposed to show is that he has a very good and cogent program. He has not done that. That's an irrelevant thesis for the purposes at hand. Or secondly, defending a claim of one's own irrelevantly. So I'd like to prove that my program for helping the poor is a good one. And then you go on to give an uh, argument that shows that helping the poor is a good idea. That's uh, your own thesis, but it's irrelevant to what you were supposed to be proving. An example of uh, irrelevant thesis, the advocates of conservation contend that if we adopt their principles, we will be better off than if we did not adopt them. They are mistaken, for it is easy to show that conservation will not produce an Eden on Earth. Well, it may not produce an Eden on Earth, but we might still be better off with those principles than others, so that's irrelevant thesis. The second example, 
I fail to see why hunting should be considered cruel when it gives tremendous pleasure to many people and employment to even more. Well, I mean, but cruel things can give tremendous pleasure and employment to people, so you haven't proven your point at all here. It's an irrelevant basis. But it's like missing the point. You're not on the mark here. You're not on the real question. Okay, before we do the exercise of having to do with fallacies of presumption, I would like to point out something about uh, Engel's way of outlining and um, the difference that you have in the outline I've given you. First of all, you'll notice that um, under fallacies of relevance, excuse me, fallacies of presumption, I have only two divisions, overlooking the facts and distorting the facts. Engel has three divisions. He has overlooking the facts, evading the facts, and distorting the facts. So the difference between Engel and Bonson's categorizations is that he has overlooking the facts and evading the facts. I only have overlooking. So the first thing we have to ask is, is there a difference between overlooking the facts and evading the facts? I find that a rather arbitrary distinction. Isn't evading and overlooking about the same thing? And when I look at the way he describes him in general, I still don't see that there's any great difference. His uh, justification for that division is found on page 134 of your text. He says, in the second category of the fallacies of presumption, the error lies not in overlooking the facts, as in the first category, but in seeming to deal with all relevant facts without actually doing so. <laughs> Which comes down to saying, You've overlooked the facts, although it looked like you didn't, or it seemed like you didn't. And I just didn't think that was a big enough difference to qualify as a separate category. Again, cutting the cake is somewhat arbitrary for purposes, but I just couldn't follow him in that. And so that's why your outline is a little bit different. I think it's easier, if you're trying to memorize this, catch on. Someone overlooks the facts of certain sorts, someone distorts the facts. And so I, I like to put it that way. Um, and thus, uh, we have overlooking the facts about the uniqueness of things, about the options that are available, or overlooking the facts as a shortcut to your conclusion, like don't even bother to look at the facts, which he calls evading the facts. I think that's just another way of overlooking them as a shortcut. Now, there's one other difference you may want to notice here. As he creates his category of evading the facts, that I think is just a version of overlooking the facts, he includes the fallacy of special pleading. And he has not convinced me that that's the most convenient place to put that fallacy. On your outline, you'll see that I've put special pleading under the category of uniqueness, overlooking the facts about uniqueness. Now this overlooks the facts about uniqueness in the sense that it, uh, it affirms the uniqueness that doesn't exist. I'm in a unique situation. I specially plead for my case. I don't sweat. I glow. I never get angry. I'm always just indignant. Okay. So we have a special pleading, meaning that you put yourself in a special category. So it seemed to me that it, it fits better to put that under overlooking the facts about uniqueness, um, whereas Engel puts it in evading the facts um, in the same way that, you, um, that you're engaged in question begging. I can, I can see a similarity between evading, excuse me, a similarity between special pleading and question begging. But I think it's more, pe people engage in special pleading more because they think they're unique or there's an exception for them. So anyway, I do prefer my outline, but I want you to, to see that there's a difference between us. Now, let's look at some, um, some exercises having to do with uh, fallacies of presumption. And as we answer them, however, we'll answer in terms of Engel's breakdown not the one that you have here. I've just explained to you my outline and why I think it may be advantageous. The prior exercises will follow his procedure. All right, let's begin on page 132. 
where Engel has his first subset of fallacies of presumption. He says, identify the fallacy of presumption. It's either going to be sweeping generalization, hasty generalization, or bifurcation. Well, you can hardly miss it. You take a guess and have a 33% chance of getting it right. <laughs> so I'll have to call on you to explain it. Okay, let's begin with number three. If we're going to buy a car, we have to buy either a good one or a cheap one. We can't afford a good one, and we don't want a cheap one, so we'll just have to do without a car. What fallacy is committed there? Bifurcation. Bifurcation. Either or, and he's, he's making fault. Um, a good car, good and cheap are not incompatible terms necessarily. They are opposite. Or might, might we want to say both are relative terms, and so it's not either or. You might find one that's fairly inexpensive, but still kind of good. Not absolutely good, not absolutely inexpensive. So yes, it is what I call the false antithesis, a false either or here. Another way of putting the answer is, there's a third alternative, an inexpensive car that isn't great, but it's okay. Number 12, they just don't care about traffic law enforcement in this town, so they let ambulances go at any speed they like and let them run red lights, too. I love it. What they cared about is they wouldn't let those ambulances do that. What fallacy are we talking about here? I said safety generalization. They applied a case to that. Well, that's Hasty generalization? Oh, they're taking the case that ambulances are allowed to run red lights and then generalizing that they just don't care about law enforcement. Is it hasty or is it a sweeping generalization? Sweeping generalization that there's a speed law out here that should be kept, and so ambulances should be keeping it as though they're not an exception to the rule. I suppose you could look at it either way, couldn't you? Because here it says, Using an isolated example as the basis for a widely general conclusion. Yeah, but what lies behind this seems to me the idea, the understanding that uh, traffic laws are universal rather than general. So I, I'm not going to say you know that that's wrong. I'm just saying you can look at it either way. Okay. We all get the point though. Obviously, ambulances are an exception to the rule. So if you're going to if you're going to take the ambulance example and generalize, then you have a hasty generalization. Or if you're going to expect that traffic laws have no exceptions, so ambulances are not an exception, then you have a um, sweeping generalization. Actually, I took it to mean that they don't care about traffic laws because they let traffic do that. Okay, so in that case, it would be hasty generalization. Fifteen. Let me warn you that you will find in the world a certain few scoffers who will laugh at you and attempt to do you injury. They will tell you that John D. Rockefeller was a thief, that Henry Ford and other great men are also thieves. Do not believe them. The story of Rockefeller and of Ford is the story of every great American. And you should strive to make it your story. Like them, you were born poor and on a farm. Like them, by honesty and industry, you cannot fail to succeed. We well, can get really worked up on that, right? <laughs> What's the fallacy, though? The fallacy is the hasty generalization. Okay, explain. Because he's saying, well, they were poor and on a farm. You're poor and on a farm, therefore you can succeed because they succeeded. Yeah, or what you're taking is a couple of illustrations of poor boys who made good and saying, okay, any poor boy can make good. Well, that's a real hasty generalizing from what may be very unique illustrations for all we know. Okay, let's turn to page 147. Looking at Engel's second division of fallacies of presumption, he says, identify the fallacy, begging the question, question begging epithet, complex question or special pleading that is committed and explained. And we'll begin with number 21. The world was not created by God, for matter has always existed, and therefore the world must have always existed. I've heard unbelievers say that kind of thing. What is the fallacy here? Um. Begging the question? Begging the question, exactly. If God created the world, then matter is not eternal, has not always existed. So that's taking for granted what's supposed to be proven or, or on the other side disproven. Okay, let's jump to number 33. 
This measure ought to be deplored by all right-thinking people. Question begging epithet. Okay. And why is that so? I agree with you. Well, I had to figure out why it was so. So maybe you can help me think of that. No, in other words, you didn't understand the answer. To the I question. didn't understand necessarily why it was born. Because but that's what the sign is all about: is seeing yeah. why it's assigned to it. It's a question begging epithet because here you have slanted language being used to beg the question. To say that, um, to take my side on this, to deplore this measure, is to be a right-thinking person. That assumes that you are right in what you're saying, and so you're saying anybody who's right-thinking will agree with me. Well, instead of proving that you're right, you're just saying that you should agree with me because I'm right. It's implying what you're implying it's implying what somebody ought to do based upon. It's implying that I am right and right thinking people will agree with me. That if you're a right thinking person you'll agree with me. That assumes that you're right. You're supposed to be proving that you're right. Okay. Why should you agree with me? Because you want to be right thinking. Well, but are you right? That's the question. So yes, it is a question begging epithet. Okay, one more, number 36. Let's stock up before the hoarders get here. That's kind of funny, isn't it? Um, People stocking up before others get there is usually what you call hoarding, isn't it? But anyway, let's stock up before the hoarders get here. I kind of have a question begging epithet too because there. Now, I don't think it's so much a question begging epithet because it's not as though he's assuming, well, no, he is, I don't want to put it that way. Uh, calling them hoarders might seem like a, um, a question begging way of doing it, but it's really Special pleading. Special pleading. You're doing the same thing. Yeah. You're doing the same thing they are. They're hoarders. You're stocking up. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay. And now turn to page 167 for his third category of fallacy for presumption. He says, identify the fallacy: false analogy, false cause, slippery slope, or irrelevant thesis. Oh, you know, irrelevant thesis is another difference in our outlines I should have told you about a few moments ago. I put irrelevant thesis under fallacies of relevance. I think it should be obvious why I would do that. That if you're not on the point, one is an uh, irrelevant appeal, trying to cite evidence that's not really evidence, and the other is an irrelevant conclusion, arguing for something that's not on the point. Whereas Engel makes this a fallacy of presumption. And again, he was my teacher, and I, you know, I don't have a book out like he does, so there's reason to respect him. But I do think I'm right in this case. It'd be, e it's easier to think of uh, irrelevant conclusion as a fallacy of relevance than a fallacy of presumption. But for these exercises, we will use his breakdown: false analogy, false cause, slippery slope, or irrelevant thesis. One of those four. And let's take number 42. An electrical power failure in the southwest is imminent. UFOs have been seen over Boulder Dam, just as they were seen over the Niagara Powerhouse shortly before the Great New England blackout. What fallacy is that? False cause. False cause, right. UFOs were seen prior to something over here, so UFOs caused it. Now we've seen UFOs in another place, so they're going to cause uh, this as well. Exactly. False cause. Of course, there are also problems in that you're accepting the validity of the sighting of a UFO. But even if you grant that, this argument's not a good argument. Okay, number 45. How can nuclear energy be so bad if it is our best source of energy? Actually, that was an irrelevant thesis. Because just because it's our best source of energy doesn't mean that it's good. Exactly. 
So you, you're proving one thing when you're supposed to be proving another. You're supposed to be proving um, that it's not bad when what you really prove is that it's the best source. Should we stop for a minute on that one, Pat? Do you understand irrelevant thesis yet? Yeah. I it's when you're arguing for something that's not on point. And here, the person's trying to say, how can nuclear energy be so bad? They're trying to prove that nuclear energy is not bad, and they do so by saying, it's our best source of energy, so there it's not bad. Well, being the best source doesn't prove that it's not bad, though. And now number 51. I look upon Fran's place, which is a legal brothel in Nye County, Nevada. I look upon Fran's place as a kind of insurance policy for the safety of young women and children in this area. As long as there is a kind of safety valve sort of a place where men can go to, my 15-year-old daughter Hillary can walk home at night in perfect safety. The argument is I support a legal brothel so that there will be a place that men can go to satisfy their sexual urges and therefore my daughter can be safe when she walks home at night. What's wrong with this argument? Slippery slope? No, I, I, I don't think so, but why don't you explain what the slippery slope is? Well, he's, he's saying if, if one, one thing is, one factor is eliminated, therefore all factors are eliminated, his, his wife can walk home safely from um, without actually worried about being sexually threatened, but she's, you know, she's excluding all the other things that are involved in safety. I agree with you. So that is eliminating one, one crime and all the rest are going to fall away. Yeah, I, well, okay, I don't think the person's saying that if we eliminate one crime, all the rest will fall away. This is perfect safety. And even if you were, that wouldn't be slippery slope. Slippery slope is, if you take this step, you'll have to take a lot of other steps as well. And he's not saying, if we legalize prostitution, then we're going to have to take all these other steps. Actually, it's the opponent of prostitution that would be inclined to commit the slippery slope fallacy. If you do this, then what's next? Then we're going to have, you know, child abuse and other sorts of things. That would be a slippery slope argument. This really is not slippery slope at all. What, what is the problem here? I agree with you that the person's thinking incorrectly. But why is it incorrect? I had it as a false analogy. That's exactly what it is. Let's see if you understood why. Because he compares a brothel with a safety valve, and a brothel is not a safety valve, or as an insurance policy. Hmm. Let me expand on it and try to show what's buried in this. It's a good illustration. I think it's a false analogy between rape and prostitution. That is to say, uh, his daughter is safe from rapists because men who want to have sex can go to a prostitute. As though frequenting a house of prostitution is the same kind of thing, or the same kind of defect of personality or morality as rape, which it is not, as a matter of fact houses of prostitution either encourage rapists to pay for their crimes or do not satisfy rapists at all. Uh, now granted, rape is not mentioned there, but what is being thought here is that there's an analogy between the rapist who might get his daughter and the man who goes to the brothel. It's a false analogy. Now if you want to say a house of prostitution is like a safety valve, and that's a false analogy. Um, it really is based upon another kind of analogy that is a false one. That I would see more as a literary or rhetorical illustration. Um, but the two tie together. In one sense, a house of prostitution is not like a safety valve because it is not draining off the sexual energy of rape. It's only draining off the sexual energy of men who are willing to pay. So either way, you're right, it's a false analogy. Yeah. Um, also, along with the false analogy, isn't there a sort of a false cause that's assuming, well, my daughter can walk home in safety because we've got this brothel place? Well, that would be arguing that since we opened the brothel, women have been safe. Therefore, opening the brothel caused them to be safe. But that isn't what he says here. So there's no false cause. 
He's arguing in favor of the me of measure as for its prospective value. Okay, because okay, I figure I, I put down this false analogy, but I, I also quite put down a question mark about the false cause because it seemed to me that that the place was there, and he was saying yeah. he was, he was implying really, that. Yeah, but you'd really have to have more um, in there stated, not implied, in order to accuse him of false cause. Okay. He's not making a historical remark here. Okay, uh, now page 171, putting all of these together, all the categories together. Identify the fallacy presumption that's committed in or could result from each of the following. Let's take a 54. Since education results in improvement, everyone, irrespective of ability, should be given the advantage of a higher education. I said I was speaking generalization because just because, because it's generally meant to be so, but it may be universal in that education will always result in. Sweeping generalization, you said? Mm -hmm. Okay. Takes the generalization that education results in improvement and applies it to a case that may be a special one that is uh, irrespective of ability, everyone should give it. Well, maybe some people are so ignorant that education will not be able to help them, although it generally does help them. Is that the form of your argument? Is that what he said, by the way? Uh, Did you check? Um, the is that what he said as well? Good. Uh, he, he also made mention of the fact that, there's, that there is a, a bit of a difference between education, i.e. grades 1 through 12, and higher education. Okay. In other words, education in terms of grade, uh, general education might help somebody but a specific higher education might not do anybody any good. So that would still be sweeping generalization. Right. Saying something in a general sense and then trying to apply it to a unique category. Yeah. Or would that be hasty generalization, saying what's true of elementary school is true of college and everything else? Mm -hmm. Again, it all depends on what you think the, the direction of a person's thought is. It's not going to be important. When you get out in the world and you start analyzing arguments, the point is you, you're going to be able to tell better than the illustration here will give you. And so you don't have to, don't get all, um, you know, hesitant and so much well, is this sweeping or is this, you know, uh, hasty sweeping. Make sure you understand the direction of the argument and then just use the appropriate term. 57. Why isn't a nice person like you married? And it's a uh, question begging epithet because He's assuming that nice people are married. Well, then it's not a question begging epithet. He's not trying a to prove a question, then? complex question. There's two questions here, basically. Um, well, let me think. Well, because it's not, he's not asking her, are you a nice person? Right. That's why I said it was a question begging epithet. Or it may be taking, uh, it may be question begging, it may be complex question because it's um, by implication saying you're not a nice person because all nice people are married. So I'm asking why in your case. So it can go both ways. Right? Well, yeah, again, it's a slight difference. What does he say? I probably should have looked at this way to answer him. 57, is that the number? Mm -hmm. He says it's a complex question. This question implies that only nice people are married. Huh. Ah, good. But I do think that, in a sense, there's a question begging epithet in there. And um, if, if you're saying this person's not nice by this, could, could, no, no, it's a complex question. Could it be a sweeping generalization that all nice people are married there? Well, all of these, yes, it could be. All of these are related in that the same kind of mental mistake or reasoning mistake is made. But it has the, the specific form of putting two issues into one question, so it's a complex question. But it could be considered an insult, too, and consider maybe the person doesn't want to be married, and that yeah. person should be married, and you're not a nice person. Yes, that, uh, that's what tempted me to think maybe Jay was right in calling it a question begging epithet, but the point is you have to read nice person as sarcastic in order to make it question begging epithet, and it's not. So, I mean, the nice person here I don't think is sarcastic. Certainly not in explicit semantic sense. 57, now 60. 
The United States had justice on its side in waging this war. To question this would give comfort to our enemies and would therefore be unpatriotic. Irrelevant thesis. Irrelevant thesis. The fact that it would give comfort to our enemies doesn't prove that um, we were just in what we were doing. But, uh, um, this is not the best answer, but I'm wondering indirectly if it's not also a form of uh, uh, appeal to uh, the mob, uh, emotional appeal. What? We haven't gotten into those with anyone what, yet. What about slippery slope? That the question does would give comfort to our enemies and would therefore be unpatriotic. Yeah, because those are not separate things. Giving comfort to our enemies is what's called unpatriotic. That's not like a third step down the line. That is just a way of describing giving comfort to our enemies. Oh, okay. So it's not slippery slope. Okay, now let's look at Engel's third category, which are fallacies of relevance, and you'll find a nice summary on page 186. His fallacies of relevance are the genetic fallacy, abusive ad hominem, circumstantial ad hominem, to quote way, poisoning the well, mob of people, and we'll do our exercises. Genetic fallacy, he says, is attacking a thesis, institution, or idea by condemning its background or origin. Example, America will never settle down, look at the rabble-rousers who founded it. Okay, attacking an institution because of its genesis, its origin. The abusive ad hominem, attacking the character of the opposing speaker rather than his thesis. He should clearly not be our leader. He's admitted to being homosexual. Remember my lecture, though, I said, well, by itself, that is fallacious. But if you can go on to show that there's a connection between his perversion and uh, the thesis and so forth that he's uh, arguing for, then maybe that isn't fallacious. Circumstantial ad hominem, attacking the opposing speaker by implying vested interest. Sure, he opposes rent control. He owns two apartment buildings, doesn't he? It's kind of like, well, he must be rationalizing them. Two quoque, attempting to show that an opponent does not act in accord with his or her thesis. Um, which is fallacious if it means to uh, prove that the thesis is in fact false. But it's a legitimate consideration from the standpoint of Christian morality when you say you, you ought to live by the same rules you're preaching. You ought to take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of mine. Anyway, how can she tell me to exercise more when I know that all she does is sit behind the desk? Well, okay, so she's not morally in a position to give this criticism, but maybe you should exercise more anyway. Poisoning the well, attempting to preclude discussion by attacking the credibility of an opponent. In his explanation, remember in the chapter, um, Engel points out that you poison the well when you've cut off your opponent from any possibility of a defense because anything he says will be an, will tend, people will tend to look upon that as showing that he's doing the very thing you say. If I say, you know, uh, you talk too much. And then you try to say, well, really, I don't. Well, there you go. You're talking some more. You talk too much. I poisoned the well. Um, his example, this man has lied his way out of far tougher situations than this. Why should we listen to him? The poor guy tries to respond. Yeah, you're just lying some more. You poisoned the well against him. There's no way out. And that's unfair because you're not considering the evidence. Mob appeal, using emotion-laden terminology to sway people in mass. I appeal to you as the most downtrodden and abused people on this earth. Rise up and follow me. Mob appeal, trying to have this emotional appeal so that the crowd will follow you. Um, appeal to pity, seeking to persuade not by presenting evidence but by arousing pity. I don't think we need to spend time on that. That's easy. Appeal to authority, seeking to persuade, not by giving evidence, but by citing an authority. And then he has various kinds. The appeal to the one, that is one person as the authority, or appeal to the many, um, that would be a statistical kind of thing. How could six million Americans be wrong? Uh, appeal to the select few, that's the snob appeal. I mean, if you want to be one of the hoity-toity, then you ought to do this. 
and then four, appeal to tradition, which is another form of authority. Finally, appeal, no, there's two more. Appeal to ignorance, emphasizing not evidence for a thesis, but lack of evidence against it. There must be extraterrestrial life. No one has proven there isn't. And he points out those are almost always reversible arguments. No one has proven that there is, so there mustn't be. <laughs> and then appeal to fear. And I don't know why he separates that from the appeal to pity and mob appeal, but he has seeking to persuade through fear um, the threat that Santa Claus will not bring the presents if you don't go to bed on time and so forth. Uh, the way in which I've organized these will hopefully help you remember them a little bit better. And the outline that I gave you, we have irrelevant of appeals um, and irrelevant thesis. The irrelevant thesis we've already discussed, not arguing on point. Irrelevant appeal can be to emotion, to authority, to ignorance, <clears throat> or against the man himself. And then you have various kinds of emotion. Harm, the appeal to force. Pity, the appeal to sympathy. Popular emotion, the mob appeal. The various kinds of authority, irrelevant expertise, would be the one. That's what Engel calls the one. Uh, tradition is the same as he calls tradition. Bandwagon is what he calls the many. Sometimes it's called irrelevant appeal to the bandwagon or the consensus appeal we're all agreed. You know, so many people behind this measure it can't be wrong. And then the snob appeal is what he calls appealing to the select few. And uh, then to ignorance is clear enough. The ad hominem um, breaks down into abusive, genetic, circumstantial, poisoning the well, and to quoque. So when a person is trying to support a conclusion in an irrelevant way, he or she will appeal to emotion, authority, ignorance, or against the person. Now, let's do a few exercises. Um, page 221. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, how much different is poisoning the well from abusive ad hominem? Um, poisoning the well is specifically an attempt to cut off any possibility of an answer. Rather than saying that a person has a bad character, saying, well, he's a communist and you can't believe what he says. Poisoning the well is an attempt to show that if he answers, um, the only answer he can give you is poison. I mean, you, you've made the, there's no source of an answer. A communist could appeal to say, okay, well, I'll just, I'll quote capitalist authors to prove my point. You haven't cut him off from an answer by calling him a communist. You've just disparaged his character. When you poison the well, it more specifically, it tightens it more than that. Um, any, any move the guy makes is going to be suspect because of what you said about it. And that these are all very subtle differences, by the way, is seen in the fact that Kofi does not distinguish them. You remember um, Kofi uh, puts poisoning the well under abusive ad hominem. It says this is another way of speaking of it. So what you have in the case of Engel, it's kind of like if you go into one paint store, you notice they have um, 80 different colors. All right. You go into another paint store, they may have 240 because they've drawn sharper distinctions of shades and so forth. And so what you have in Kofi is you have the 80 paint swatches and uh, Engel gives you 240. So you are right, they're very related, but if you want to draw that subtle distinction, I think it would be drawn the way I've just given you. Okay, page 221, let's do a few of these and then call it a day. We are asked to identify the fallacy of relevance, which is going to be one of the following. Personal attack, mob appeal, appeal to pity, appeal to authority, appeal to ignorance, or appeal to fear. Mistake number four. No, if you don't mind losing a tire going off the road and maybe killing yourself, you don't need a new tire. Look, does that prove that you need a new tire in a fallacious way? No, it's appealing to fear, saying right. that you're going to die if you don't do this. That's right, the appeal to fear. Is the appeal to fear uh, legitimate sometimes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
it, if it is the case that without a new tire you're going to go off the road and maybe kill yourself, it seems to me that's a legitimate thing to say. But uh, it doesn't by itself prove that you need a new tire that I can make you scared that there's the possibility you'll die. Number eight. Congress shouldn't bother to consult the Joint Chiefs of Staff about military appropriations. As members of the armed forces, they will naturally want as much money for military purposes as they think they can get. It's a personal attack on Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, what kind of fallacy is it? Uh, it's about, I just thought it was a personal the terms they use. Um, it's about the abusive ad hominem. Not abusive. It's not saying they have a bad character. Uh, circumstantial. Circumstantial. It's saying that given their circumstances, of course they would say that. All right, number 12. All loyal Americans will deplore the passage of this bill. Okay. That sounds to me like a either an appeal to authority because all loyal all Americans would deploy it or more likely an appeal to a, a sort of a mob appeal. It's mob appeal, exactly. Because uh, the mob is going to be stirred up by thoughts of loyalty. Number 12. Oh, that's the one we just did. Number 20. I'm on probation, sir. If I don't get a good grade in this course, I won't be able to stay in school. Please, could you let me have at least a C. The appeal to pity? No fooling. <laughs> <laughs> Rather blatant, right? It's like, I deserve a C because it's pitiful if I don't get one, and you should pity me in this situation. Number 32, Black says, well, anyway, when we're silent, nobody is playing games. White, silence itself may be a game. Red, nobody was playing games today. White, but not playing games may itself be a game. That's an appeal to ignorance because they're they're uh, talking about something that isn't proven. Because it's not proven, so it must be. At least White is arguing that way. Yeah, I do think that's the thrust of it. This was a tricky one when I looked at it last evening. But I think it comes down to saying, uh, well, we don't know otherwise, so maybe not playing a game is a game. So it's kind of like you can't show that it wasn't, so maybe it is. Kind of a strange argument, isn't it? Number 36. Let's get down to brass tacks. None of us here is a Philadelphia lawyer. We're just plain folks trying to see our way clear. There's been a lot of highfalutin talk about economic implications and such like, but the plain fact is that if they build that dam here, it will cost us money we just don't have. I'm against it. We're all against it. I was really confused by this one. I don't know. Oh, no. That's why I read it the way I did. It's just so blatant. I said it was an appeal to ignorance. Oh, no. No, it's, he's not arguing that my thesis is true because no one has proved otherwise. What's he appealing to here? Mob. It's the mob, right. Hey, we're not highfalutin Philadelphia lawyers here. We're just plain folks. It's kind of like we're all, you know, we're all together in this. I'm against it. We're all against it. I mean, it's such an obvious appeal to the crowd, to the mob. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed uh, doing these informal fallacies. Um, and again, don't let the fact that the exercises call for a particular answer, and in some cases there might be you know, one answer that's a little bit better than another, don't let that intimidate you from, in this world, not only cleaning up your own act when you reason, make sure you don't commit these fallacies, but in finding them in others. And in the end, it's not going to be crucial that you remember exactly what the terminology is, although I don't think you'll do a good job unless you master the terminology. The main thing is you see how irrelevance, ambiguity, and distortion enter into people's reasoning processes in ordinary language. At this point in the course, we're going to turn away from ordinary language fallacies, and we're now going to um, start looking at formal reasoning. Formal reasoning. And um, we're done with Engel. We'll be looking specifically at Kopi. Um, in Kopi, we come to what he calls part two of his textbook, deduction. Um, and what I will be calling in my outline, formal reasoning.
And just to give you the lay of the land here, the study of deduction will come down to a study of two kinds of um, argumentation. One that focuses on categories or classes, and another that focuses on connection, connectives between propositions. When all is said and done, all we're going to be doing now is learning the logic, very strict regimented logic of some, all, and not, how those terms are used, how classes relate to each other. Some of this, all of that, not this, not some, not all, how those expressions work in our language. And that is the first part of part two, chapters five, six, and seven, categorical syllogisms. Categorical syllogisms. However, at the end of chapter seven, he moves away from categorical syllogisms into arguments of the uh, latter kind dealing with relationships, or if then, and that leads us then finally to symbolic logic, the method of deduction and quantification theory. But now, my main, my main point here is just to make this very simple for you. We're going to study, first of all, the words some, all, and not. That is to say, categorical syllogisms. What's the relationship of classes? The class of sailors, the class of drunkards. Are all sailors drunkards, some sailors drunkards, some drunkard sailors, all drunkard sailors, and um, some are not. Uh, it's not the case that all are. How do we relate classes of things or categories of things? So the first part of deduction deals with categorical syllogisms, dealing with some, all, and not. Categorical syllogisms are tested in three ways. You'll get this in chapter 6, um, sections 2, 3, and 4. The categorical syllogism is tested by logical analysis, or analogy, pardon me, logical analogy, that's discussed in 6.2 toward the end, and then the limitation of that is indicated, or tested by Venn diagrams, a way of having intersecting circles, to test the propositions if the conclusion really follows from them, and then finally tested by the rules for syllogism, which are given in 6.4. So let me say it again. The first of two kinds of, sim uh, excuse me, deductive logic we're going to look at is categorical syllogisms that relate classes of things, using the words all, some, and not. And these categorical syllogisms are tested in three ways, by logical analogy, Venn diagrams, intersecting circle diagrams, and certain rules. Now having said that, I am not going to teach you or require of you the Venn diagram um, test for categorical syllogisms. It takes a long time, many people find it complicated, it's awkward, and it's really not all that necessary. And I've, I've rarely known people to use it after they've taken a logic course as well. It's always there if you want to go back and, and look at it and teach it to yourself. And it amounts to, if you're good at math, um, you should be able to, to figure it out, the intersecting circles. And you, what you do is you fill in uh, the one premise, what it means diagrammically, the second premise, and then you ask, has the conclusion been diagrammed, incidentally, when you did that? But we aren't going to do that. We're only going to learn the test by logical analogy, which has its limits, and then finally to come down to the test of rules. So if you want to put it briefly, we're going to learn about the, the categorical reasoning of some, all, and not, how classes relate to each other, and then we'll test them by certain rules of syllogism. Then the second part of deduction will deal with the relationship of terms, or the logic of terms and or not if then, and or not if then, or if you will, connectives between propositions. And that begins to be discussed at the end of chapter 7 under disjunctive and hypothetical syllogism. 
when Kofi discusses disjunctive and hypothetical syllogism, he's discussing the relationship of or and if not and not, but in ordinary language. Here he's dealing with those connectives as they appear in ordinary language. We're going to put that aside, however, and start testing all such connective relationships in terms of symbolic logic and the method of deduction in chapters 8 and 9. So you follow what we're doing then, what we're moving into? We're moving into deductive logic, first categorical, secondly connective or propositional. We're going to deal with the syllogisms having to do with some, all, and not, and how to test them by rules. And then we'll begin with ordinary language, but move quickly into symbolic logic, dealing with and, or, not, if, then, and how to test it in this algebraic fashion. Quantification theory will then bring together class logic, category logic, and propositional logic. So you have quantification, some, and all, as well as the relationships of and, or, not, if, then. So number 10, obviously, is in a formalized language and is much more difficult than the other chapters. Here's what I'd like you to do for our next class session. I'd like you to read Kofi chapters 5 and 6 and then do certain assigned exercises. Kofi chapters 5 and 6. However, please skip, please omit section 5.6, section 5.6, and 6.3. 5.6 and 6.3 deal with the diagramming of categorical propositions and testing syllogisms, and as I've said already, we're not going to go through that. So read chapters 5 and 6 with the exception of 5.6 and 6.3, and then do your exercises, and we'll work on those in class and hope to understand them.